Good morning, class. We are here to talk to you about Lee and Marlene Cantor and their theory of assertive discipline. Okay, technical difficulties, but <laughs> this is Lee and Marlene, and they were quite the love couple. They met when they were in college, and Miss is going to tell you a little bit more about their background. This is Lee and Marlon Cantor. Uh, they came up with assertive discipline as a theory. Um, as we go through this, you guys are going to uh, recognize some stuff that's very familiar to what we've already learned because their theory has been adapted by most schools. Um, as far as the two of them, they met in 1968 while attending USC. We're not going to hold that against them because they're actually intelligent people. <laughs> Um, Lee earned his master's degree in social work, so primarily that's where his background came from. But Marlene earned her, her degree in SPED, so she was a special education teacher for several years. Um, and before they began their research in teacher discipline, she actually encountered a student that had such disciplinary issues that the normal methods didn't work. So she wanted to come up with, with better methods, and that's kind of where uh, their research began. Now this was back in the 70s. So back then, it wasn't exactly assertive discipline. It was more authoritarian. And it's evolved throughout the decades, which I think really sets them apart from some of the other theorists that we've studied because theirs has actually changed and evolved to meet the needs of students and teachers as they're coming in and out of the school system. Um, uh, their discipline methods were, was compiled in a most influential book called Assertive Discipline. A take charge approach for today's educator. It was written in 1976, but a lot of the methods, of course, we still have adapted and used in our classroom today. So there's three types of discipline. There's hostile, assertive, and non-assertive. Those are the definitions below there. Now this is stuff that we have discussed before, but to give some examples of that, if I'm a teacher in a classroom, and Hunter has not raised his hand after I've told him that that's what we need to do in order to get my attention. If I come up to Hunter and I stop the class and I say, Hunter, you are so stupid because you're not following that rule. That's a hostile teacher, right? That's hostile discipline. It makes you look bad, creates a negative learning environment. <laughs> Non-assertive is if I see Hunter playing on his cell phone and I'm like, well, I'm not going to say anything to Hunter. I'm just going to let it go. Maybe no one else will notice. That's a non-assertive teacher. Very passive, and you're going to lose control of your classroom very easily. So, in the middle, you have assertive discipline. It involves clear, concise directions. It involves a teacher-led classroom, not in an authoritarian way, but in a firm, warm way. And I know that those adjectives can be a little contradictory, but there is a way to be firm and a way to still have a warm, engaging personality with your students. So some of the must-haves for assertive discipline. This one is highlighted because, first and foremost, as we have been taught <coughs> excuse me, all semester, you have to have a positive, authentic relationship with your students. If you do not have that out the gate, forget it. No amount of discipline is going to work. Um, clear and specific rules and procedures. Of course, we have talked about that a lot. Now, the Panthers believe in both negative consequences, which is um, basically a discipline hierarchy. It's kind of what we um, come up with in our, in our teacher project as far as coming up with our negative consequences for misbehavior. In the discipline hierarchy, one needs to be more punitive to the, than the next. So the first starts as a verbal warning, which the Panthers are very big on. And then the next one moves on to something a little more serious as the behavior gets out of hand. They also believe in positive consequences, which is a reward system. And I know that that's very um, con contradictory to some of the stuff that we have studied and very controversial for some teachers. But they also believe that not only do you give individual and group rewards for positive behavior, but you can give um, rewards as far as verbal praise, which really helps you know, build a good, strong classroom environment. So some key aspects of assertive discipline. The first one is that in behavior, teachers should insist on proper behavior. You have the right in the classroom to insist on that. You also have the right to make sure the learning environment is suitable for other students. 
So of course you need proper behavior. The cancers are real big on proper behavior is needed within the community. So if you start teaching kids in the classroom, you'll build stronger communities as they graduate and move on to the job force. Oh, also, teachers need to describe and model the behavior. So yes, you're setting those rules and procedures in place and you're describing it, but they're real big on modeling it. Be the role model. Don't just stand above them, set the rules and say, do this. Actually be the role model in the room and, and go through that with them. <laughs> so, teacher failure, firm control. A lot of people get this confused <clears throat> with the authoritarian part of it. But it's not, it's just a way of successfully managing behavior within a classroom. As we have all learned, once you let them slide into bad behavior, they will continue to stay there. And once you lose control, you're done for the year. So Lee Cantor says, it is impossible to teach when students aren't ready to learn. His thing is, they need to be ready to learn, and they also need to be in a positive environment. Our educational rights of both the teacher and the students. The cantors believe that teachers have the right to create and enforce rules and the students have a choice in behavior. They have a right to learn in, peace, in a peaceful environment. So like we learn in classroom management, it's important to get those procedures and rules situated at the beginning of the semester so they know what you expect of them. If they don't have expectations that they know that you want, they will feel free to do whatever they want to do in the classroom. <coughs> and Lee Cantor says, I will tolerate no student stopping me from teaching or stopping other students from learning. You are all going to succeed in my class because I am not going to let you fail. And I really think that quote is very important because student behavior and student outcomes are a direct reflection of the teacher in the classroom and if you don't let your students fail, if you don't let them misbehave, they're not going to do it because they're going to know what you expect from them. They're going to know that this is wrong and I'm not going to do it. Okay, so this is how you would implement <coughs> the theory of the cancers in your classroom. There are a few steps. You set expectations, like I said earlier, for correct behavior. Establish four to five rules. You don't want to give them too many rules because if you give them too many rules, it's going to be a lot for them to handle. And if it's too much for them to handle, they're going to act up anyway. So um, introduce precise rules in a clear way. Check for student understanding and review periodically. Don't use don't. Don't tell them what they shouldn't do. Um, later on, you're going to see what the cancer believe you should do. Um, you should establish and introduce consequences for misbehavior. Negative, this is a negative. Um, determine positive consequences, which are rewards, <coughs> and uh, therefore improve behavior. Always quickly respond to misbehavior. The cancer believe that you should start with the warning. If you don't catch it at the beginning and you don't catch it quickly, it's going to escalate very, very quickly. And it's going to make your classroom environment totally unproductive. Um, the cancer believe that you should tell the student what he should be doing. Don't say don't. So for example, Hunter, you should be doing your work. You should be behaving better. Ryan, you should be doing this. Don't say, Ryan, you shouldn't be doing, you shouldn't be throwing paper across the room. There's different stuff like that. Um, they believe that you could use a broken record technique by repeating commands two or three times. I know that sounds nitpicky, nit picky, <laughs> but um, I, I kind of agree with that. If you say it a couple times, no more than three, but if you say it a couple times, then you'll get into that rhythm and they'll start behaving correctly. If you give students a choice to follow the command or face a consequence, 
Misty went over the disciplinary hierarchy earlier, so I'm not going to go into much more detail about that. And as we learned in classroom management earlier, they believe that you should use <coughs> proximity, eye control, eye contact, my bad, and talk to the student. They believe that you um, can take the student out of the classroom and talk to them, and the behavior will change. As part of their giving a choice. They believe if you do that, you're actually giving the student a choice. Right. Model and explain positive <coughs> behavior for students, like Misty was saying earlier. Be a good role model for your kids because you are in a position that they're going to follow what you do. You are, I don't want to say you're their parents away from home, but like they look to their parents for examples of what to do in the home, they look to their teachers for examples of what they should be doing. Use positive repetitions technique. This is a clever way to disguise rule reinforcement. So, do you have an example for that? Well, if you use the positive repetitions, instead of saying, instead of, you know, say Ryan's not doing what he's supposed to be doing, but three students over here have done what they're supposed to be doing. So instead of calling out, and of course it depends on the situation, if he's doing something really bad, of course you need to call that out. But if he's just, you know, maybe not really paying attention, or maybe not, you know, raising his hand when he should, I think the Canders believe that if you do the positive repetition, you will kind of use that model of positive behavior. So instead of calling him out for not raising his hand, you'll say, okay, Hunter, Kimberly, Villa, you guys did a great job. You raised your hand and he called on you. Good job. So you're showing that positivity, but you're also reinforcing your rule. You're kind of disguising it as, you know, I told you to, you know, raise your hand to be called on without specifically, you know, pointing out any misbehavior. Okay, so we have a scenario that we would like you guys to participate in. Um, we would like for you to provide an assertive response to the following situation. Should they read or should they read it? You can read it. Okay, so five students are gathered at a small table working on a group reading lesson. While three students read or listen, Aiden and DJ are poking each other and making faces. As future teachers, how would you approach this using a certain discipline? Are you just going to ignore it? You just gonna be like, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of the best way to do it. I don't want to. I don't want to embarrass them in front of the class. Right. But at the same time, I do want to make it clear that they should stop doing what they're doing and get back on task. So. What an appropriate thing to do would be to walk up to them and ask them politely at first to get back and start doing their activity. Proximity control. Yeah, proximity yeah, the control. The trainers are really big on that, mm -hmm. you know. And I believe that if you walk up to them and, and you say, okay, this, you know, we need to get back on task. Mm -hmm. But you do it in an assertive way. Mm -hmm. You don't insult them, you don't right. point them out. Or you could walk up and say, okay, I see that the other students, the three other students, I see you guys are, you know, doing what you're supposed to do. You guys are really on task. Good job. Right. Hopefully that kind of brings them in. And of course, you know, if it, if it continues, they also believe that, you know, you could take them out in the hallway and talk to them. They're, right. they're real big on the talk. And remember, so. you don't want to be hostile with them. Aiden, DJ, <laughs> stop poking each other. Get on task. You know, I have said really that because those are coincidentally my son's names. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt like that was important to use that in that scenario. So anyway, that is our presentation of sort of discipline.